It sits crumbling in the Texas sun, dwarfed by Reliance Stadium. The Houston Astrodome, once dubbed the eighth wonder of the world, now looks like a practice bubble. Trapped inside this portal to the past are the ghosts of the Houston Oilers. Here in 1993, they were one of the most talented teams in NFL history, and maybe the most dysfunctional. There are more good players here than anywhere I've been. <laughs> and I've been to three Super Bowl teams. One of the best, most talented teams I've ever faced in the National Football League. We just had more off the field distractions than we really needed. It was just one thing after another. Everybody needs to quit talking and start playing. We were a mess. <laughs> we needed therapy so bad. I defy anyone to try to come up with more crazy things that happened in an NFL season than the 1993 Oilers. The story of Houston 93 didn't begin in training camp. It began the previous January, at the end of the 1992 season. Get it going, baby. Bills at their own 48 yard line, right from the shotgun. Four man rush for the Oilers. Right throwing it to the right through the hands of McKellar. It's picked up, picked out. Down the far sideline. They'll score for a touchdown. Oh, when it rains, it pours, don't it? Up 35 3 in the third quarter. It looked as if the franchise was on its way to exercising the demons of playoffs past. You say not look ahead, but I'll guarantee it. I was thinking about the, the next round. It's over, you know. I was I started loosening up my pads. Everything was light. We were taking it for granted, but then the bottom just fell out. Trying to sweep to the left. He's racing for the flag. He's got it. Touchdown. Kenneth Davis got BB at the 10 at the 5. Touchdown. Before you know it, uh, this thing started snowballing out of control. Right out of the shotgun. Looks toward the end zone. Touchdown! <laughs> Down the middle. Touchdown, Andre Reed. We self-destructed. And of all the losses in Oiler history, this has got to rank as the most devastating. The worst day of my life. It'll never go away. I think this one here going to break this team. We're right there with the best shot ever, and we blow the biggest lead in NFL history. You know, that is gonna stay with you for a while. Oh yeah, we're embarrassed. Uh, you know I mean, what you want us to do? You want us to go put a gun upside the head and shoot ourselves? I'm sure everybody there is getting tired of this team making the playoffs every year and not finding a way to get uh, uh, further, especially with all the talent we have on this football team. In fact, I'm getting tired of that word, talent. This was the sixth straight year the Oilers, who boasted nine Pro Bowl players, had reached the playoffs, and the sixth straight year they failed to reach even an AFC championship game. Fans were cynical when thoughts turned towards 1993. Owner Bud Adams shared their impatience. Mr. Adams said, if we can't win this year, then you know the team is likely to be dismantled and a lot of y'all are gonna be playing different places. We were all just like, why would you say that? I don't think we needed Bud Adams to state that to light a fire under us. And we're only gonna get so many chances here. And if we don't make it happen, they're gonna blow this thing up. Adams hired a new defensive coordinator he hoped would be the answer to Houston's problems. It was a surprise to everyone, even his head coach. The Jack Party Show with the head coach of the Houston Oilers, Jack Party. News out of the oil patch. The Oilers have a new defensive coordinator, Buddy Ryan. Jack Pardee's doing an interview at the same time that Bud Adams is announcing we've hired Buddy Ryan. That just kind of, you know, screws up the dynamic from the beginning because for the most part, Buddy Ryan doesn't really think he submits to Jack Pardee's authority. He's the boss of the defense. He's not running the, the team. Did you answer to Pardee at all? 
No. You say hello. No further you and Mikey. We were certainly excited that, you know, Buddy was coming in with his aggressive blitzing 46 defense. Damn, go get him! I thought we needed that little bit of spark and that little bit of fire to, to get our team going again. They know uh, that I'll, I know what it takes to get that Super Bowl and win, and uh, that's what we're going to do here. When you go through a log slide that, you don't know how it's going to affect your football team emotionally and psychologically. And, and Buddy is the type of guy that comes in with his bravado, with his confidence, that he was going to bring that swagger that we needed. Buddy Ryan brought swagger and credentials, but he also brought plenty of baggage. Everybody knew Buddy's reputation as being rather bombastic. And that was so anti-Jack Pardee. Buddy liked to be out front in the limelight. How is this going to work? If Mike Ditka struggles, you know, to control Buddy, then Jack was going to struggle to, to control Buddy. I certainly had heard of the, you know, the difficulty in Chicago with Mike Ditka. Until you go through the actual experience of it, I don't think you have any idea how bad it really is. One of the, well, let me start okay. again. It's okay. You changed me up. All right, here we go. All right, all right. I'm ready. You okay. Want to start. okay. All right, I'll, Take I'll do it. Take a breath before you start and, and stand still. Right. Okay, and camera ready. And go. One of our basic plays, which will give you an opportunity to see some of the variations that exist for all of our receivers on every single play we have, is our 91 switch X read. The Houston Oilers' claim to fame was a revolutionary offensive attack known as the run and shoot. It had led the league in passing the previous three seasons. It was video game type numbers and really a lot of fun. And we came in with, hey, say, we're gonna throw this ball 50 times a game. That was the NFL's first version of probably of wide open football. We had Pro Bowl receivers, we had a Pro Bowl quarterback, we had Pro Bowl offensive linemen. Tremendous offense, a lot of numbers, a lot of scores, a lot of, can you win a championship with it? Mm, don't know. We went to the playoffs every one of those, those years we were doing it. Uh, we just couldn't finish the job at the, in the playoffs. It seemed like we got there, we're one of the best teams, and just couldn't, and just stalled. The biggest liability is you couldn't control the clock. In order to succeed with it, you had to be aggressive with it. You couldn't just sit on the ball. You couldn't just run the ball. You had to continue to throw the ball. You know, I mean, it's a uh, aggressive and risky proposition. New defensive coordinator Buddy Ryan earned a claim for creating the 46 defense. At training camp, he made known his feelings for the Oilers' style of offense. He thought that the run and shoot offense was accident prone. He continued to make those comments uh, in the locker room, in the clubhouse, every time he got a chance. Chuck and Duck, uh, run and shoot. <laughs> I just think it, you know, it was uncalled for. It's kind of a cheap shot. Down deep, what he's going to find out at the, at the end of this whole thing, that he's going to be very appreciative of the type of offense that he has here. Are you opposed to the run and shoot? Well, it's uh, not an offense that I, that I would have, but uh, it's one that I'm living with here and uh, trying to win a Super Bowl with. Our rooms were divided. We didn't, you know, these were the older complexes, and we had the old sliding doors. There's no sound barrier. And so, yeah, I mean, Buddy is talking loud, and you know you know that Kevin can hear him, you know, next door. There wasn't a flap in his gums just a little bit. I mean, it was every week consistently. I mean, there was a lot of stuff being said, stuff that's fighting words, you know? And um, that stuff doesn't just die. The run and shoot and the 46 defense, together, they were supposed to get the Oilers over the hump. Early on, the combination was explosive in other ways. You could see it happening. I mean, you could see the glances during practice. There was really a tension mounting. We knew how competitive Coach Gilbride was and Coach Ryan was, and, and that was the chance to show, you know, run and shoot versus the 46. That was our primary purpose, was to go out there and beat Buddy up every day because the way he treated us. We beat his defense so many times in practice and made him look bad so many times in practice. 
I don't know where all this talk about the lack of respect for our offense came from because he couldn't stop it half the time. And that's where the problem lied. Uh, he didn't have respect for it, but couldn't stop it, and it just burned him up. We get cards from Kevin Gilbride and his team. Buddy would say, forget that. Run this. And so we send a blitz at him and, you know, pow, I mean, we, we're hitting Warren Moon and, and Gilbride, what is that? That's not on the car, what is that? Offensively, we were working on the last play of a half. Buddy wasn't cooperating, Buddy blitzed it. Started an argument on the coaching staff. And so we repeated the play and Buddy blitzed it again. And we repeated the play and Buddy blitzed it again. So all of a sudden, the emotions ran high. Coach Party tried to step in and Buddy sent them all in. Buddy sent all the coaches in. But he sent all the players in. And at that point in time, there was, well, like, whoa, whoa, who's running this thing? Wasn't anything Jack could do about it, unless Jack punched him out, but that wasn't the party way. Coach Party was that kind of guy. He would sit back, he relax, let all the craziness happen around him. For us, he was maybe not the kind of leader that we needed at the time. He kind of went along with the flow. Someone needed to step in. We knew these guys on defense. We've been playing with them, you know, for several years, most of them. We got along. All of a sudden, now you have this divide. We was Buddy Ryan guys, and that, that's, that's the mentality we have. It was Buddy Ryan's defense team, Kevin Gilbride offense team, you know, two separate teams. Or should I say, all of versus allers. <laughs> but he just told him, forget the rules, just go run over and make your mark, you know. He was the catalyst that amplified every dysfunction that we had on that team. Buddy knows exactly what he's doing psychologically. <laughs> Buddy Phil, the tougher we made it on our own offense, the, you know, the better they would get. Everybody was like, even if you had a red jersey on or whatever, Buddy said it, was, it wasn't no hands off. In the game, they're gonna get hit. So why not get hit in practice? Guys were worried about you know getting cut. They were worried about getting their knees you know knocked on. And that's the motivation that was brought by that side of the football that we're gonna we're gonna beat you guys. And he knew full well what was gonna take place. The cheap shots and trying to put guys out in practice. There was some uh, some ugly ugly fights. That's what Buddy wanted. It was a fight every day, and it was personal. Ray Childress was a perennial pro bowler. Mike Munchak was a future Hall of Famer. Both were respected leaders. But as the regular season approached, even they were fighting. That was one of the craziest scenes I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it was a vicious fight. Ray was kicking at unmentionables and trying to poke people in the eye. We all had one goal, that's to win games. It wasn't to be best friends or, you know, to be pen pals. When those guys were going at it, then we knew, oh, man, there was, there's, there's something different about this football team. A bevy of Pro Bowlers and the addition of Buddy Ryan made the Oilers a popular Super Bowl pick. But as the 93 season began, great expectations gave way to harsh reality. We kept talking championship. The opening day, we go down to New Orleans. They whooped our butts. They beat the, the mess out of us. With Oiler owner Bud Adams saying this has to be the Oilers year, and with National Magazines picking Houston to go to the Super Bowl, the Oilers defensive coordinator Buddy Ryan will make some changes from a philosophical point of view. We had uh, mental errors, and uh, so we're going to have to cut our game plan back, hopefully, and that will eliminate some of them. He knew the system worked in Chicago. He knew the system worked in Philadelphia. So it wasn't the system. It was, it was us. This works. It works. I'm telling you, we just got to stick with it. It's going to work. I remember Buddy pulling me aside, and he's like, 96, do you think I'm losing him? I'm like, well, we definitely got to play better. And he's like, no, <laughs> you know, but am I losing him? I said, no, coach, I think we're going to be all right. The next week, Chiefs quarterback Joe Montana sat out with an injury, and the Oilers' defense looked like it was supposed to. Throwing outside tight end Mike Dial at the 45, fighting his way forward, and the ball is stripped away by Nishman. He just stole the ball from Mike Dial. 
even in victory, Ryan kept taking shots at the Oilers' offense. He again called it the chuck and duck. This time, somebody shot back. Emotional wide receiver Ernest Gibbons. Don't get discouraged. Just keep working. Just keep working. Come on. It's not only riled me up because it's riled a lot of other guys on the team up. But you know, but everybody's not saying anything. And I'm not trying to be the, the big shot of the bunch or anything like that, but I just get tired of hearing the same old shit. And then, of course, Buddy Ryan, <laughs> in his own way, the only Buddy can be Buddy, said, you know, Ernest Gibbons, I don't even know who he is. I don't even know Ernest Gibbons, and I haven't said anything about our offense, and they claim that I have. All I said that when Jerry Glanville put it in down here, I called it the Chuck and Duck, and I'm not the only one in the league that calls that, I'll guarantee you. Who is Ernest Gibbons? And I'm like, I'm Ernest Gibbons. And then I reply back, who the f are you? Remember, they went and got you. I didn't go get you. Only thing you brought was animosity and, and, and jealousy. This was a battle fought on many fronts, including Houston's airwaves. The only time I ever, ever gave him any thought was on Friday when I had to do my radio show because I'd have to defend the attacks that were made on me on Thursday with his radio show. Caught in the middle was 37-year-old Warren Moon, who had plenty of pressure to deal with as it was. He was a black quarterback in the state of Texas, in the city of Houston. Warren could never be seen in public having a drink. Warren had to have the perfect home life. Can Warren finally get us to the Super Bowl, or get to a, a AFC championship game? Is Warren the guy to do it? And it's finally, I think he felt a little bit of just being pressed to get everything done and things wasn't working so well. In a loss to the Chargers, Moon threw four interceptions and was benched. Now it's Cody Carlson. Cody Carlson has replaced Warren Moon. Cody I thought he could come in and, and let Warren not have to press, but we don't have any controversy. Warren's a quarterback, and uh, we just got to get over this hump. Warren will bounce back strong next week. Moon struggled again, and with former President Bush in attendance, the Oilers felt the wrath of their unhappy constituents. There's a lot of skepticism here in Houston. I mean, naturally, this, this game was not televised in Houston. They couldn't sell out the Astrodome, which is not a big stadium. Warren Moon uh, went out to the offensive huddle to start this next series, and they booed him. Deep route to Gibbons, intercepted by Bailey. Warren Moon just looks like, what was I thinking? I don't know. I think you're one in three. We're just going through emotions. It's the worst I've ever seen. Some Oiler faithfuls are no longer true blue believers. Fans are educated, particularly in Texas. Football is a big deal. They know if you have the talent, you're supposed to win. And if you look at that roster and you see those all pro players on there, there you have a reasonable expectation to think that you can win it. Win it all. It was all kind of controversy. Party was going to be fired. Buddy be named the head coach. No, Gilbride would be named the head coach. Now, I don't know if you're hearing all the speculation. We're hearing the speculation about your job situation right now. How much longer can this team afford to wait to do something about this? We have got to wait till we play Buffalo now. Any suggestions? Well, I think just the name Buffalo ought to bring out the best in us. Is this the center of the car? Didn't we win this in the playoffs? There's no way that we could go into, go into Buffalo and win that game. We already knew we were doomed when we went in there. We know we didn't have a chance. Just don't do what you did last time. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Same hey, conversation, right? <laughs> Same conversation. You didn't get the ball early in the year. Playoff no, 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 no. Playoff time. Touchdown. I'll be read. <laughs> Here is Kelly, play action pass over the middle of Ann is there, Reed at the 10, Reed at the 5, he runs it for the touchdown, Andre Reed. Moon was benched again, maybe for good, and the offense and defense finally found common ground, ineptitude. When you look up team in the dictionary and uh, all the positive characteristics and qualities about team. We had none of those. In Houston, the long knives were starting to come out. And that's why you are one and four. We were starting to talk about, well, who are going to be the high draft choices next year in April? Several of us in the front office had already written the season off. We didn't feel like it was going to be possible to recover from a start that bad.
<laughs> Warren, will you stop and give us a second? No. Will you stop and give us a second? Just one second. Two questions. Really hot in your face. One comment. Wait for an off-pro quarterback to act, or <laughs> what do you think? Warren Moon had overcome much to reach his NFL status. Never had he been faced with being a second string quarterback. He just wasn't playing well. The team was not winning. They were one in four. I'm running out of excuses. I really am. Everybody thought that he wasn't good enough. He had nothing left in the tank. The, the frustration on Warren Moon's face was palpable. You could see it. And to be in that situation where people didn't respect his gifts and his talent, that put him in a, in a tough spot. Are you going to the bench this Sunday? That's hard for me to say, but that certainly is a possibility. Jack called me into his office, and, and I was uh, a little bit surprised. And uh, he told me he was going to make the change, and he was very nervous telling me that, too. I, I, I knew Jack, and I know that he's a guy that doesn't like a whole lot of confrontation. And uh, I didn't want to make him feel any more uncomfortable than he was, but I was very, very disappointed. I think it was an act of desperation. Hey, we got to do something to get this thing going. I think Jack felt that nothing would have uh, shocked this team into, into getting going more than, you know, sitting down your star quarterback. The Oilers are on a three-game skid, and they've taken, I guess, the most drastic measure you can, and that's benching a guy who's been to the Pro Bowl five of his ten NFL seasons and putting Cody Carlson in to run the offense. Putting on that hat as opposed to putting on your helmet and having to stand over there on that sideline, I didn't know exactly what, my, what, I, what I was supposed to do. Very, very different feeling for me. As much as I wanted to root for Cody to do well because I wanted our team to do well, there was a, definitely a side of you that didn't want him to do as well, and so maybe I'd get my job back. I didn't play this game this long to have it in like this. And he's going to run for it, heads for the corner, dives, and does he make it? Yes! Cody actually started off the game playing pretty well, and we, he, he sprinted for a gain and wound up tearing his hamstring, or, or, or I'm not sure Warren would have got back in. So Warren gets the opportunity, and the team gets the opportunity, to change the course of the season. Warren gets new life. And here comes Warren Moon in a relief role for Cody Carlson. Interesting twists and turns of, of fate. It was like a new life. You know, when I walked back into that huddle, it was like, guys, here we go. You know, I'm, I'm back. Let's make this thing happen. His cadence was more definitive. You know, you do this, do this. And he wasn't usually that way. And when Warren came right back, this time we told ourselves, well, we're not going to let this happen again. Let's go ahead and, and start winning ball games. Moon again looks to throw, looks, looks over the middle, and the end zone touchdown. Is there magic in Moon's bag of tricks? This is the Oilers, so with the win comes problems. A win and the return of Moon was buried in the headlines by a controversy that went national. It's the macho world of pro football versus the new sensitive man of the 90s. In Texas, the Houston Oilers football team is finding out what happens when a star athlete puts pampers before pigskins. On Saturday, offensive lineman David Williams had stayed home with his wife for the birth of their first child. The Oilers wanted him to catch a flight the next day to make the game in New England. When Williams chose to remain home, the Oilers find him a game check, and Babygate was born. The story surrounding Babygate encompassed so much more than athletics. You're talking about the birth of a child and how you know, a sport like the NFL is going to deal with that. You know, in today's NFL, it's not even an issue, you know, if somebody's having a baby, then they're going to stay at home and have a baby, and it's understood. 20 years ago, it wasn't quite the same. He was definitely the first to, to step out that way and, and put family above his job. I'm learning, I'm learning. He's it's, learning. It's not exactly easy. When right I got up this morning to change him, his diaper was on backwards, so he's still learning. <laughs> In the locker room, guys were debating openly about, man, what'd you do? Well, what would you do? Man, come on. The work ethic in the National Football League is you don't miss. I thought he should have been there. I had had uh, kids born during the season as well, and I and I was somehow able to get to the game and play. It's mind-boggling that he doesn't, that you don't just get on a plane and get there. 
you know, once the baby's born, what do we contribute? Nothing, right? See the baby, tell mom, kiss her on the forehead and say, hey, sweetie, I'm gonna go go to battle. I'll be back in 36 hours, you know, keep me posted. I knew all along I was gonna be there for, for, for the uh, birth of my first child and, and I wasn't gonna uh, back down from that decision. And like I said, I, said, I stand strong in what I did. At some point, Mr. Adams made the remark that David had misplaced priorities, which I think was part of what set off the firestorm. We gave him time off for practice. We gave him time off for the meetings. We gave him time off to be with, the, with his wife so she could have the baby. We expect him to be at the game the next day. That story, it just built and it built and it built until everybody was weighing in on it, including Al Gore. We're with David Williams. I remember Bob Young, our offensive line coach, compared it to, you know, it's like you're going off to war. You don't leave your buddies. He just gets confused. He's a great kid. He just gets confused about, you know, everybody wants to be with their wife. But, you know, that's be like World War II going on. You say, well, I can't go fight, honey. My, my wife's going to have a baby. You, you got to go to war, especially when you get paid like that. Women's groups all over the country, mothers, everybody was killing Bob Young. We have to feel football is pretty important. Not, uh, it, it's not bigger than World War II or having babies or anything like that, but it's pretty important to some of us. <laughs> Maybe we can get down to football and see how we can be a better team in trying to solve all the world problems. Houston did become a better team. Talent eventually trumped the avalanche of dysfunction as the unfazed Oilers began to play winning football. The team that had been assumed dead was alive and well. At some point in time, a team reaches the bottom where there's nothing else dysfunctional that can happen to you. This is who you are and the world be damned. We were starting now to hit our stride and play the game the way we were supposed to on both sides of the football. The defense had figured it out. They were knocking quarterbacks out of games. They were playing the way they were supposed to play with Buddy Ryan. We gave up 20 points one time for the rest of the season. I think we're back on track right now, so uh, all you doubters, better look out for the Houston Oilers. The Oiler bandwagon was getting bigger each and every week as it went along. For the first time this season, we can say it, the first place Houston Oilers. It was a long battle back, but you finally got there. So I'm inviting all the people that want to jump on our bandwagon, come on back, come be part of us. We'll take you in. We love you. We love you. Give me a hug. People were back on because you start, instead of getting the finger, you're getting a pat on the back. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Super Bowl! Super Bowl! Back on track! Back on track! There's no mystery why people are so enthralled with sports. You know why? It mirrors the drama of life. It's so exciting. You gotta love this stuff, man. The Oilers' new drama. A win in Pittsburgh would give them a division title, and Houston was preparing to party. The champagne was on ice, but the team's issues bubbled beneath the surface. From the outside, it looked like everything was great, but on the inside, it was like a, a rotting grave. As much as the win streak and getting the home field advantage was something that I aspired for, it was like at the same time, why am I so miserable going through this process? Did I feel that, that the winning somehow cured everything and that we'd, we'd all were singing Kumbaya at the end of the day? Absolutely not. Nothing slowed down. We still fought just as much. We still, you know, had just as many disagreements. The latest was between running back Spencer Tillman and defensive tackle Jeff Alm. And nobody knew just how dramatic things were about to become. Jeff hit my position coach, Frank Novak, and um, I took that personally. And I flew into him. I got him first, and then all the cavalry came to break it up. And this kind of haunts me to this day because I told him afterwards, I said, Jeff, something bad's gonna happen to you. And he, you know, called me a couple of expletives and uh, less than a week later, he was dead. 
Investigators say Alm was speeding and apparently lost control. As soon as the vehicle uh, hit the guardrail, the passenger was thrown from the vehicle. And about 30 feet below the overpass lay the body of 25-year-old Sean Lynch, a friend from Alm's hometown. Lynch was killed when he hit the concrete below. They were both inebriated. In his inebriated state, he was in a complete panic, and he called 911. Police theorized that Alm became despondent when he got out of the wrecked car and realized his friend was dead. They believe he took the shotgun from his car. And then the shots. Three would be fired into the air, the last into Jeff Alm's mouth. It was the day after the tragedy, and as the Oilers reported to work, you could see that the reality of Jeff Alms' untimely death was starting to set in. You think of yourself sometimes as invincible. To have a teammate who was in the locker room, you know, with you literally, you know, days, a week ago, and to have him gone, yeah, it had an impact on us. Jack Pardee's shiny moment as a coach for the Houston Oilers was that day. Jack was as stoic and he was as sincere and as, you know, honest and as down to earth as anybody could ever be. He'll certainly be remembered and, uh, you know, for the rest of us, uh, you know, life will go on and we've got to uh, make the best of that. Really did a, a, a great job of kind of expressing what we were all feeling, but in a very calm way. The team actually got a lot closer. How we started talking to each other more, hanging out with each other more, expressing to each other how we feel. Our camaraderie got closer. Hey, we gotta do it for Jeff, man. That's the only thing on our mind. We do it for Jeff, we'll go all the way. For the shot go, Donald's gonna throw. Down the middle, he throws it, intercepts it. It's Orlando at the 35, 30, 25, 20, down the sideline, 10, 5, touchdown, Houston Oilers. We're sitting around here looking for Buffalo. This ain't the same team now. We're a team of destiny. We're going to take this thing. I think it's appropriate and fitting that we give this game ball to Jeff's parents on behalf of our victory today and being Central Amen. Division champion. All right? The Oilers returned home united by tragedy and embraced by their city. They were a team together, but in the regular season finale, they would again be torn apart. With a two touchdown lead late in the first half, Kevin Gilbride kept the offense on the attack. We got the ball, said, hey, let's maybe we, there's enough time, take it down, put another touchdown on the scoreboard. Carlson. Intended for Tony Jones. The defense thought that they were done for the half, and all of a sudden they're seeing we're throwing it, and I think uh, attention start to rise. What are we doing? And then the fumble happened. Second and ten, hit from behind, loose ball. Rodman after it, recovered by the Jets. Bill Pacquiao. Buddy was so <laughs> pissed off about that. So apparently I'm being MNF'd up the sidelines behind me, but I don't hear it until I hear somebody gets to, you know, buddy gets to my right side. And I hear him say something. I, I turn and say, what'd you say? This is after the fumble. Take a look at what happened on the sideline with Kevin Gilbride and Buddy Ryan. There's Buddy Ryan. There's Kevin Gilbride. That's Buddy Ryan taking a swing at Kevin Gilbride. Boy, he came at me and uh, hit him. That's the end of the first half, the score. The Oilers 14, the Jets nothing. I went to the tunnel, I said, well, I'm gonna get that son of a gun right now. And there's cops all over the place. You're in the same locker room, but he come in with his defensive staff. To, again, it was always a group around. It was well thought out. I said, buddy, you're gonna have to be prepared to deal with this situation when the game's over. And there was a long pause and then Buddy said, maybe nobody saw it. I don't think there's anyone in the right mind would say that they would condone their coach, you know, hitting another grown ass man on national television. You know, a couple of guys that came and said, coach, you know, do what you gotta do at the end of the, but can, we're, we're playing pretty good now. Let's get through this thing. Let's see. And I said, that's, yeah, I'm fine. Well, let's, let's focus on what, getting to the Super Bowl. We won and what have you. And unbeknownst to me, everybody in the world has seen it. And of course it was all, all hell had broken out. 
I can't even find him yet. Looking for a white man. Poor old Kevin, he just, he was devastated. People were saying Buddy punched him. People around the country, did you see Buddy Ryan punch out Kevin Gilbride? Go back on that. Excuse us. Excuse us. Buddy didn't punch Kevin. He tried to. He, if Curtis Duncan hadn't gotten in the way, Kevin Gilbride would have kicked Buddy Ryan's ass. I just wish you could have had an opportunity to finish it out a different way. Thank you so much, sir. Nobody was talking about the playoffs or 11 straight wins, the longest streak in the NFL since the 72 Dolphins. The punch was a wildfire, and Buddy Ryan kept stoking the flames. What he said about Kevin after the game was, Kevin Gilbride will be selling insurance in another year. And he said it with a smirk, like, you know, Buddy, I'm not supposed to comment, but. <laughs> Buddy's comments that were not supposed to be in the paper are in the paper. How much more can you take of this as you get ready for the playoffs? No one is managing any of this stuff. None of these train wrecks is being managed by anybody. Do you plan to do anything about this, Mike? Any kind of action at all? There's no team meeting about, you know, we're going to force a coordinator to apologize to the coordinate, other coordinator, so we're on this. There ain't none of that. It's just like, I'm just going on like, OK, nothing happened. And you have to wonder how much of these things took a toll. The Oilers had been waiting for this day for over a year. A win over the Chiefs would prove they could finish when it mattered most, and it would give them a rematch with the Bills in the AFC Championship game. From the Oilers' standpoint, they thought they had this game pretty much won before it started. We were playing a team that we had played earlier in the year and beaten soundly, and we were playing them at home. There was one big difference between that first meeting and this one. Joe Montana, who's that, man? Oh, that guy's 37 years old, ain't he? I'm gonna take it to him today, knockout, baby. Early on, Buddy Ryan's defense kept Joe Montana eating AstroTurf, while the offense built a 10-point lead. Boone, not a delay, Brown up the middle, touchdown! Houston Oilers! The first half, again, same story. We were wearing Kansas City out. We were doing everything right, you know? It's like first half of the Buffalo game. The Oilers carried a shutout into the second half, but the Chiefs soon delivered a punch of their own. The dude scored a touchdown and spiked it on Buddy's picture. Oh, oh, oh my! The bullseye was Buddy! Hmm. All right, there, there's some sort of far-reaching message in that. I, I'm too tired or not smart enough to comprehend it right now. We just didn't anticipate that they were going to have life. Momentum had turned and weighed down by a season's worth of karmic baggage, the Oilers couldn't stop it. I don't want to say we were emotionally exhausted, but we had dealt with so much garbage. What a catch by Willie Davis! And boy, this place has gotten quiet. It was a house of cards, just waiting for that one card to get pulled away. Boom, here comes the choke. Choke City. Running play, Allen, he's got the first down to the 10. Touchdown. And ladies and gentlemen, the fat lady is singing on another Houston Oilers season. The Chiefs scored 21 fourth quarter points. Once again, Houston had blown a late lead to lose a playoff game. I was just really disappointed. I uh, didn't expect it all to end like this. Didn't expect it to end today. And um, just disappointed. I mean, we didn't get it done again. In defeat, offense and defense came together one last time to say farewell. 
I remember embracing Glenn Jack and Matthews. Kind of like you're graduating from college, you know, and everybody's, all their eligibility's over, you're leaving. 1994 would be the first season with the salary cap, and owner Bud Adams followed through on his threat to dismantle the team. We had not prepared one iota for the cap. We ended up just destroying a really good team. The franchise jettisoned its stars, and unthinkably, its face. Got a winner in town. Buddy Ryan was also gone. Despite the punch, he'd landed a head coaching job, and he was just as big a celebrity as ever. Okay, you said? Angry, angry. Be mad, look mad. Pissed. Go, ah. One, two. I get a stunt man hey, in here. <laughs> Gutted by the cap, the team started one and nine in 1994. Jack Pardee was fired, as was Kevin Gilbride. Oh, I think I predicted he'd be selling insurance in two years, and he, he, you're ahead of schedule. Is that not typical? Uh, you know, that's, that's vintage uh, uh, Buddy, and that's probably why he's uh, the least liked uh, coach in our profession. Houston had a new feud between the Oilers and fans heartbroken by the playoff loss and burned by the fire sale. The emotion of the game, a lot of it, uh, revolves around being able to, to feel like you're, you're, you're loved. And here it's almost antagonistic. Man, that was a scorned city. A scorned city that showed you just how frustrated they were by setting single season attendance records for lows. Adams again today made it clear before leaving Houston that the Astrodome is no longer a suitable playing site for his team under any conditions. I, they can't expect me to sit here and go broke. There was absolutely no public consensus for building a new building for him. The apathy among the fans was uh, the incredible part. It was like, don't let the door hit you in the rear end. Are you all ready for football? Yeah! In 1995, the Oilers agreed to move to Tennessee. Maybe it didn't have to happen this way. Not if Houston had gotten over the hump. Had they won that game, Oilers never would have left Houston. Houston would have given Bud Adams the $180 million in public money he needed for a new stadium. Today, the Astrodome sits unused. Houston ended up building that new stadium a few feet away. It houses the Houston Texans, who themselves have yet to reach the Super Bowl. Most of the ghosts live back across the parking lot. Some are happy memories. Some continue to haunt, and not even winning the Super Bowl has put them to rest. Of all the things that you know, you've been fortunate enough to be part of, that you're proud of, you know, this is the last thing you would like to be considered you know, attached to for the rest of your life. But uh, it happened. <laughs> Do you regret the punch? Regret? Oh, probably. Unfortunately, all we can do is to say we did it to ourselves. We probably got what we deserved. You can't win Super Bowls and you can't play among the elite teams in the NFL when you got coaches punching each other. And if you got enough talent, you can win some games, it'll look good, but are you gonna win a world championship? Nope.